Have a seat. Let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for doing what is um, really incomparable, uh, beyond words that you would come into the world and take rebels like us and um, do a work of redemption and reconciliation in us such that uh, we would be changed from the inside out and we would be able to even sing words like that, that we would say, um, take this world and give me your son instead. Lord, we fully acknowledge that that is only because of your good work of grace in us. It is only the fruit of the ministry of of the gospel in our lives and your word which accomplishes its work in us who believe. So Father, would you please, um, as we set ourselves apart again from the world even tonight, um, and we sit under your word, would you be powerful in our midst? Would you meet with us and accomplish in us uh, through your word only what you can do? Make us more like your son. Make us more eager to step into the world with the gospel, to bring it to the ends of the earth, starting from our homes. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you'll take your Bibles tonight and open to 1 Corinthians 16, you'll look at just two very simple verses tonight, but I want to talk to you um, as you're turning there about opposites that are inseparable from one another, okay? Opposites that are inseparable from one another. Some opposites are in an inseparable relationship with one another, and we totally embrace it. We like it that way. We get it. We understand it. Most, uh, let me give an example. Most level-headed, non-participating trophy people understand that winning and its opposite are inseparable in a game, right? One team wins and the other loses. We understand that. We embrace that relationship. You may not like losing, but you understand and you embrace the idea that in a game, winning and its opposite, losing, are inseparable. No one heads home after a game shocked and puzzled and disoriented and unsettled that one of the teams lost. Nobody goes home thinking, man, have you ever heard of such a thing? I didn't see that coming. One of the teams actually lost tonight. You never get a game that has won without the other. So you get this. Some opposites are in an inseparable relationship, and we totally embrace it that way. But some opposites, which are in an inseparable relationship with one another, are a little bit more difficult to embrace. For instance, we we can be shocked and puzzled and unsettled and disoriented and even disheartened when a trial invades and overshadows our blessing that we're enjoying. In fact, the blessing may actually still be present in our lives, but the arrival of the trial has shocked us in such a way that it unsettles us, and we sometimes walk away from those moments thinking, I I didn't see that coming. Even though God's word has only ever made it clear that trials and blessings in this life are inseparable. In this life, you don't get one without the other. And we know that. Inseparable opposites are everywhere. You are loved and you are hated. You are understood and you are misunderstood. You are honored and you are mistreated. As Paul writes 1 Corinthians, he is on his third missionary journey. And he is currently in Ephesus while he writes this. And that is um, modern day Turkey, first century, they often called it Asia, Asia Minor. So these words that we're going to look at in 1 Corinthians 16 are words that he uses to describe what his gospel ministry in Ephesus and in Asia was like at the time of the writing. And I want you to see if you can identify the inseparable opposites in his words Chapter 16, verse 8, he says to the Corinthian church, but I will remain in Ephesus until Pentecost. Why? 
for a wide and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Let's call this an inseparable pair of opposites, gospel opportunities and gospel opposition. I don't know how much you have thought about that lately. Um, We live in a world that is increasingly becoming more and more hostile to the gospel where we live and more hostile to you. How have you been thinking about these two inseparable opposites lately? You don't get life with only one without the other. You you do not live in a, a life right now where you will only ever have wonderful gospel opportunities and there will be no opposition. And the same is true on the other side. You will never live a life where the only thing you have is gospel opposition and no gospel opportunities. They go together and they are inseparable. But have you felt lately knocked off your balance a little bit or disoriented by increasing opposition that is coming? Have you been thinking, man, I I can't believe this is happening? I feel the need these days more than ever to shepherd my heart so that I think rightly about the rising opposition to the gospel. I have found that my heart is a factory, uh, an assembly line of anxieties, uh, and it doesn't have any supply chain issues in supplying those. More than ever, I've needed to shepherd my heart with God's word regarding what it says about the subject of opposition to the gospel. Um, in a role where I am trying to see more and more missionaries go into the world that is hostile to Jesus Christ, uh, that has to be on the forefront of my mind. It needs to be on the forefront of your mind. I need to see these inseparable opposites as the Bible sees them. We've just sent um, our furloughed friends, the Cans, back to Papua New Guinea. Um, In the mountains of PNG, there are gospel opportunities for them. And... There is gospel opposition. And in your own household, perhaps, all the way back here, there are gospel opportunities for you. And there is gospel opposition. And we need to think rightly about these two things. God's word can do that. It can direct us to think the thoughts that we should think. We can have realignment with truth take place even tonight. So my aim here in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 8 and 9, is to reestablish in our minds the inseparable relationship between opportunities for the gospel that God gives and the opposition to the gospel that is there. And Paul gives us an amazing opportunity to see those inseparable opposites alive together. And my hope is that you'll be more fortified as a result with greater courage to press forward with the gospel wherever he has you, wherever you may face opposition to the gospel. And so that you wouldn't say something like, there's some strange thing happening to me that Peter told his audience to not be surprised by. So two simple points tonight from 1 Corinthians 16, verses 8 and 9. We'll just do opportunities for the gospel first, and then we'll do opposition to the gospel. That's the way they come in Paul's verse. Let me back up, though, and read chapter 16, verses 5 to the end. Look at verse 5 of chapter 16. Paul says to the Corinthian church, he's already been there, he's already planted that church, obviously, and now he's on his third missionary journey, and he says, but I will come to you after I go through Macedonia. For I am going through Macedonia. So he wants to leave Asia. He wants to leave Turkey. He wants to go all the way up to through Macedonia, probably visit Philippi again and go through Thessalonica and around to Berea and eventually make his way down to the province of Achaia where Corinth is. He wants to do that. And perhaps, verse 6, he says, I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may send me on my way wherever I may go. For I do not wish to see you now just in passing. In other words, he's saying, I don't want to come to you right now, right this moment, because if I did, I'd only be able to stay with you for a little bit of time, and I don't want to stay with you for just a little bit of time. I want more time with you, so I'm going to come to you later. For I hope to remain with you for some time, if the Lord permits. Verse 8, so I will remain in Ephesus until Pentecost. Why, Paul? Because a wide and effective door 
has opened to me. So let's talk first about number one, opportunities for the gospel. In verse nine, Paul says that there is a door for him in Ephesus. A door, as you know, provides an entry point. It provides a passageway. And Paul is, of course, speaking figuratively here. The door is a gospel opportunity for him in Ephesus, in Asia, that makes him want to stay there and not leave. And Paul says that that door of opportunity has opened. That tense there means that in the recent past, that opportunity opened up for him, and it now still stands open for him. So evidently, Jesus Christ, the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth, and who promises to be with his missionary servants to the ends of the earth, opened a door for Paul in Ephesus, in Asia, He did it in the past, and it still stands open for him for preaching the gospel and for planting churches. Make no mistake about it, that is what Paul did all throughout Acts. When you wonder what Matthew 28, 18 to 20 actually looks like to go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I commanded, all you have to do is read Acts, and you find out that what they did from Jerusalem through Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth that gets covered in up to Acts 28 is Paul planted churches everywhere. So Paul just can't leave Ephesus. He can't leave Asia at this point. Notice how he describes the the door in verse 9. It is a wide door. That means it is a great door. Literally, we could translate it, it is a mega door. It's a mega door. That adjective is used in a way to show you that whatever it is you're talking about, if you're going to use that adjective in front of it, a mega something, you're meaning that this one is off the charts. This one is not in the same category as the other ones. This one is a completely different thing than the others. So compared to other gospel opportunities, and listen, Paul would know this, wouldn't he? He would be able to think all of his gospel opportunities he's ever had so far on three missionary journeys, and he would be able to know when to put that adjective mega in front of a gospel opportunity, wouldn't he? And so he is saying, compared to the other gospel opportunities that I've had, this one in Ephesus, in Asia, is off the scales. It is not in the same class as my other opportunities that have been given to me. When God opened an opportunity for the gospel and for church planting in Ephesus, he swung open a mega door for Paul to do it. Let me uh, give you an illustration of just the exact opposite. When we moved into our home in Tempe about um, 18 years ago, my oldest daughter was about five. And like Elissa, Elissa, just like Sydney and Jace, they, they all would do anything for a bet. And, and I used to bet, I started about betting my wife when we were first married, I would bet her $20 to do something. And when she did it, I quickly moved all of my bets to $1. And so I bet my kids a dollar all the time to do crazy things. And Elissa was always like one of the first ones to run and do the crazy things. And so we had this little doggy door in this house. It's a new house. We had a doggy door. It was a little entry point, a little passageway, right, for a little dog that we never owned. And Elissa gladly accepted my dare to go out and come through that door. And so she hopped down and she went out the door and she got on her hands and knees and she put her head through it. And then she realized, wait a minute, if I'm going to get through this, um, I've got to do some contortions, maybe dislocate a shoulder and get through it, and she kept trying, and she kept trying, and she eventually did make it through that tiny little doggy door. That is not what Paul is talking about in Asia. He he doesn't have to stop and think, okay, um, how am I gonna, how am I gonna say, just, just, how do I get this message through? How do I, how do I go about church planting? He's not doing any spiritual contortions or dislocations to try to get in and to preach the gospel and to plant churches. Paul had an off-the-scales mega door thrown wide open for him. He didn't have to think about how he was going to go through it. It was, like the, it was like he was standing on the edge of a field and there was no door. It was just wide open space for him to go. 
It probably just refers to the, the idea of, of the wide extent of the region of Asia that was opened to him. In other words, Paul isn't just ministering in Ephesus only, as you'll see. Paul had a wide region to run into with the gospel and with church planting. So it is a megador. He also describes it with one more description in verse 9. It is a wide and effective door. Effective. Wherever Paul stepped into that wide open region, the work that he did, the gospel influence that he had was effective. And basically it means this. Everything he did worked. Everything he did worked. It wasn't just a wide open field for him to run through and he could go anywhere that he wanted. It was that, but it was more than that. In that gospel opportunity, the gospel was powerful and effective wherever he went. Do you want to know what that looked like? We can know. Let's go back to Acts chapter 19 and you can actually see this. So go back to Acts chapter 19. And we'll look at Paul on his third missionary journey as he made his way to Ephesus. In chapter 19, verse 1, it says, Now it happened that while Apollos was over in Corinth, Paul passed through the upper regions and came to Ephesus, and he found some disciples there. That just means that um, Paul left his sending church of Antioch of Syria, and he traveled by land. He took the land route rather than sailing. And after a unique encounter with some disciples in Ephesus who were only familiar with John the Baptist ministry, Paul then entered into the synagogue. Look at verse 8. And after he entered the synagogue, he continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. Now, take a look at verse 9 and 10. What happens? But when some in that synagogue crowd were becoming hardened... And they were not believing, meaning they even were speaking evil of the way before the multitude. Paul left them and he took away the disciples reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And that took place for two years, not three months, 24 months. And he did it so that who? All who lived where? Not just Ephesus, you see where he's at? All in Asia heard the word of the Lord, and not just his own people, the Jews, but who? The Jews and the Greeks. That is a mega wide open door, and everything he's doing is effective. Drop down to verse 18. You remember the story? There's many who, are, who practice magic in Ephesus. And when they got saved, they started burning their magic books, right? Look at verse 18. Also, many of those who had believed kept coming, confessing and disclosing their practices. And many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and they were burning them in the sight of who? Everyone. And they counted up the price of them and they found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. Listen, that's 50,000 days worth of wages for a common laborer. If you work about 300 days a year, that's 166 years worth of labor for one person. That is a ton of money. That is a wide open, effective door such that people want to turn away from their pagan magical practices and burn their books. Drop down to verse 20. And so the word of the Lord was growing mightily and it was prevailing. Mega wide and effective door. And that takes us up to the point in Acts in chapter 19 when Paul actually wrote 1 Corinthians. Uh, Take a look at verse 21 and 22 and see how these verses sound similar to 1 Corinthians 16. Now, after these things were finished, Paul purposed in the spirit to go to Jerusalem after he had passed through Macedonia. That's where he wants to go. And he wanted to then go around to Achaia saying, after I had been there, and by the way, that's where Corinth is. And after I've been there, then I have to go to Rome. But, not but, but and having sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. Do you recognize that? That's when he decided to stay in Ephesus for a while. 
because of this open door that had been thrown open for him. Now remember, we're trying to get a sense of what a wide and effective gospel opportunity looks like for Paul. So let's keep digging. Go to Acts chapter 20. Paul makes his way back close to the church in Ephesus. This is later on Paul's third missionary journey. He invites the elders in Ephesus of the church to come to the port city of Miletus, or Miletus as some say. Paul describes his ministry um, in Ephesus, in Asia, while he is there. Look at verse 20 of chapter 20. Look what he says. You guys know how I did not shrink. Think of the doggy door. I didn't shrink down to get into, I didn't have to find for ways to to pull back my message and look for little ways to inject a little bit of something here or there. I, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable. Whatever it was that was profitable for them, Paul could say it and he did say it and it worked. It was profitable. And it was teaching you publicly and from house to house. He, he had public ministry. He had private ministry from house to house. He didn't have to pick one or the other. He wasn't in a, a position where he had to figure out, okay, how do I get through this little opportunity? Is this only a public one or is it a private one? Should I be quiet about how I go about this? Should I just talk to people individually? Maybe that would be uh, acceptable. He didn't even have to think that way. He could do anything he wanted everywhere he went. It's pretty amazing. Solemnly testifying, again, to both Jews and Greeks, no ethnic group left out testifying to them about repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Drop down to verse 27. He says it again, I did not shrink from declaring to you what? The whole purpose of God. He didn't have to sit there and think, I don't think they got, I don't have much time or much of an audience to receive much of this, so I'll give them some of the purpose of God. No, he could give it all to them. The whole counsel of God, the whole purpose of God he could give. Drop down to verse 31. Therefore, be watchful, remembering this about my time with you, night and day for a period of three years. Full stop. He didn't have to just think, you know, this is a dangerous place. I better just do it at night under the cover of darkness. But during the night and during the day, for how many years? Three years. Paul stayed in Ephesus longer than any other place that we know of on his missionary journeys because of this amazing gospel opportunity that he had. He says, I did not cease cease to admonish each one with tears. He could go one by one by one by one, and he could even say the hard things where they they needed a warning from him, and he could do it with tears. He held nothing back from them on this gospel opportunity, and he did it for three years. So not only could Paul go anywhere that he wanted, through that mega wide door, but he could tell them everything he wanted to tell them. He could do it any time that he wanted to do it. He could do it any way that he wanted. Everything worked. It was an effective gospel opportunity. And this opportunity was beyond comparison. It was off the scales in comparison to other opportunities that Paul had. Now, let me show you some other places where Paul or Luke use this open door language. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. I want you to see this. Paul uses this language. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. He says, and this is actually just a little bit later once he did leave Ephesus and make his way towards uh, the Corinthians. He says, when I came to Troas, which is north of Ephesus on the way up towards Macedonia, when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, and when a door was opened for me in the Lord, I had no rest for my spirit, not finding Titus, my brother, but saying farewell to them, I went on to Macedonia. So this is interesting. He stayed in Ephesus because of that mega door open to him from the Lord. He travels north to Troas in Macedonia, and he found another open door in Troas only to choose to not stay at that one and take advantage of that opportunity. Because to him, finding Titus 
who had been at Corinth and he knew the condition of the Corinthians, he, he had to find Titus. That was more important to him at that point than taking advantage of the open door in Troas. Very interesting. Go to Colossians chapter four. Let's look at another use of this from Paul. So now he's writing to one of the churches back in um, Asia, Colossae, and they would have been one of the fruits of his open door ministry that he had in Asia. And this is what he says to them. Verse two of chapter four, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well that God will what? Open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak the mystery of Christ for which I have also been bound as a prisoner. He's writing from Rome, from a prison in Rome, and he's writing back to that church saying, God needs to open doors for us. Will you pray for that? Pray for that. Let's look at one more back in Acts chapter 14. We'll see how Luke uses it. Acts chapter 14, verse 24. Paul and Barnabas are about to wrap up their very first missionary journey. And they're headed back to their sending church in Antioch of Syria. And this is what is described. When they passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. And from there they sailed back to Antioch of Syria, from where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they had arrived and gathered the church together, they began to report all things that God had done with them and how God had what? Opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. Paul describes now the open door from the side of the Gentiles' experience. We have seen from Paul's side that it is an open door to preach the gospel. It's an open door for the word. And from the Gentiles' side, on the other side of that threshold of that door that's open, they saw it as a door of faith for them to believe that word preached to them. I hope you understand this. But in this hostile to God world, there would be no gospel mission in Tempe. There would be no gospel mission in Medang where we hope to have a more robust presence um, with Finisterre. And in the villages of the Doe people in the mountains of PNG, there would be no gospel mission if God didn't open doors for us. And he does. Jesus, who has all authority in heaven and on earth, says, go and make disciples, and I'll be with you. And one of the ways you know that he is present with his disciples all the way to the ends of the earth is that he continues to open doors for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is the encouraging side of the opposite, is it not? This is not the difficult part of the gospel mission to embrace, that God opens doors. It is a joy that God even opened a doorway for somebody to have courage and come tell you and me about the gospel. We found our hearts eager to believe because God had done a work of grace in us. It is a joy that God opens doors for us then to speak and teach and preach the gospel. It is a joy that sinners have the door of faith opened up for them to entrust their lives to Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sin. But as you know, that is not all there is to the gospel mission. Let me give you another illustration. Why does a running back in a football game wear all kinds of pads and a helmet? Why is he protected from head to toe? Why? Because even though he will be given the ball, and even though he will be given an amazing opportunity to advance the ball down the field, he knows that just on the other side of the line of scrimmage is vicious opposition. And both of those things, the advancement of the ball down the field and the vicious opposition, both of those things are the glory of the game of football. No running back ever crawls out from under the dog pile over him, makes his way back to the huddle, and says, man, I didn't see that coming. Where'd those 11 guys come from? 
Every good running back actually expects there to be opposition on the other side of the line. And he says, I'm going to accept that fact. I'm not going to whine about it. In fact, I'm going to beat it. That's what I'm going to do. That's what he says. Can you imagine the game of football without opposition? And part of the glory that God gets in the gospel mission includes the opposition that we face. God gets glory in that opposition to the gospel as much as he gets the glory for having opened gospel opportunity doors for his missionaries. And the missionary who gets this and embraces these two things says, I accept this opposition and I will not whine about it. And by God's grace, I will find a way through it. And God is glorified by that. Is glorified by that. Now we've seen the first one, opportunities for the gospel. Let's look at its opposite now, opposition to the gospel. Number two, opposition to the gospel. We need to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse nine. So again, in verse nine, a wide and effective door has opened to me, Paul says, and there are many adversaries. I don't know about you, but I know where I would like to put my period in that little verse right there. I'd like to put it right after opened to me and just let the rest of it go away. But that's not the way that it is. Adversaries, it means just someone who is opposing the gospel, somebody who is resisting the mission, somebody who is trying to obstruct church planting, obstruct that gospel opportunity. And Paul understood the reality and the place of adversaries to the gospel better than anyone save Jesus Christ. Jesus told Ananias in Damascus, the the man who was going to pray for Paul, he said, I will show Paul how much he will suffer for my name's sake. With all of Paul's gospel opportunities and successes came opposition and resistance to the gospel. Just read Acts again and see this inseparable relationship um, between the opportunities for the gospel and opposition to the gospel that begins in Jerusalem and then went to Judea and Samaria and then went to the ends of the Roman world in the first century. Now, we're not told in chapter 16, verse 9, we're not told who the adversaries are. Paul just kind of calmly and coolly says, there are many, many adversaries. But do you want to see what that looked like? Go back to Acts 19 with me. Let's take a look at that now. Go back to Acts 19. And I want you to see what the many adversaries were like. Remember verse 8 of chapter 19, he went into the synagogue and he continued speaking out boldly for three months. What did that look like? That meant he was reasoning and he was persuading all who were in there about the kingdom of God. And then verse 19, but when some in that crowd were becoming hardened to that gospel message about the kingdom of God and they were not believing, they were speaking evil of the way before the multitude. So get this, it wasn't enough for them to just say, well, I have a hardened heart and I'm not going to believe that, but whatever you want is okay. It's not for me. They weren't satisfied with that. Do you understand? They had to, in front of the multitude, begin to malign and slander and speak evil of the way of Jesus Christ. It wasn't enough. Paul had to take the disciples at that point and flee their presence and go into a school and teach them. So he withdrew with his disciples to protect them from those adversaries. Drop down to verse 23. Now, about that time that Paul decides to stay, this is amazing, there occurred no small disturbance. It wasn't small, it was a big disturbance concerning this way of Jesus Christ. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, was bringing no little business to the craftsmen. A lot of business was coming through the tradesmen and the craftsmen. And these he gathered together with the workers of similar trades, and he said, 
Now watch this. You're getting insight from a pagan, an unconverted Gentile. You're getting insight of what he thought of Paul's ministry in Ephesus in Asia. Men, you know that our prosperity is from this business. And you see in here that, watch this, not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable crowd. Did this guy know that Paul had a wide open door for effective ministry? Did he know that? Absolutely. A pagan could see that. And not only, verse 27, is there danger that this trade of ours falls into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis be considered as worthless and that she, now watch this, whom all of Asia and even the whole world worship, she could be brought down from her majesty. What did he see was at stake? Everything that we're about, everything about my making a living, everything about what we worship here is at stake because there is such a wide open door by this guy, Paul, that when he comes through it with the gospel, everything works. People are burning their magic books. They're turning away from idols. They're being told these things aren't gods at all. He understood this wide open door for the gospel. Listen, when the gospel of Jesus Christ penetrated Ephesus, and when it went into this whole region of Asia, it didn't go quietly. And it didn't slowly merge respectfully and unsuspectedly and naturally into Ephesian pagan culture and make peace with it. That did not happen. No, the gospel door that God flung open cracked spiritual skulls. And the Ephesians were in a rebel spiritual condition in which the only way that the gospel could be understood by them that Paul was preaching was that it was an alien threat to everyone who was an idolater. This is a massive threat to us. We must do something as we stand in the the open space of this amazing wide open door. What should we do? You know what they did? They threw a riot in front of the open door of the gospel. Verse 29, the city was filled with confusion and they rushed with one accord to the theater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. Look at verse 32. So then some were shouting one thing and some were shouting another for the meeting was in confusion and the majority did not even know what reason they had come together. Verse 34, but when they recognized that he was a Jew, they saw Alexander coming up trying to speak to the crowd. A single cry arose from them all as they shouted for about two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Can you imagine? What, what time is it? It's 6.45. Can you imagine until 8.45, we all just stand here and we just go, great are the sons, but not great enough or whatever. We start screaming, right? Can you imagine for two hours, a massive riot in the pathway of the gospel in Ephesus? They did not see Jesus as another God to merge into their pantheon. He was only one thing to them. He was a massive threat to their hearts if they chose to stay in their idolatry and in their rebellion. Can you imagine a mega door opened for you, for the gospel, where everything you say and do and try works? And then a riot is thrown into your path. Now remember, we're looking at what that gospel opposition looked like. I want to show you how Paul also describes this. Go back to 1 Corinthians, but go to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 32. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 32. In chapter 16, he just says, "Eh, there's many adversaries. Just, I mean, look, that's, that's what he's describing. What we just read in Acts is what he's describing. Yeah, there's many adversaries. They threw a riot, right? Look what he says in chapter 15, verse 32. If from human motives, I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, dot, dot, dot. Do you see how Paul described these many adversaries? They were, they were like wild beasts. In other words, think about this. These are image bearers of God who hardened their heart to the gospel, they seem to have lost their humanness 
and their opposition to the gospel. And they resemble something more like a wild beast trying to devour Paul. That's an adversary. That's an adversary. Can you imagine what it would have been like for three years to face that? Paul actually tells us what it was like in his next letter to the Corinthians. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. This is just a few months later than 1 Corinthians. Just a few months later. And he tells us what it was like to be before these wild beasts, these humans who had lost their humanity in their opposition to the gospel. This rioting crowd of people. He says what it was like. Look at chapter 1, verse 8. He says to the church in Corinth, we we don't want you to be unaware, brothers, of our affliction which came to us in Asia. He's talking about Ephesus. That we were burdened excessively beyond our strength. We were so utterly burdened beyond our strength. That is how the missionary describes that season of ministry. So that we despaired even to live. We despaired of life itself. Verse nine, indeed, in other words, make make no mistake about this. We had the sentence of death within ourselves. We felt we received the sentence of death. The opposition that accompanied that gospel opportunity in Ephesus, it made Paul sure that he would just die under the sentence of death as it hung over him. When I put these pieces together, this for me makes me rethink all of my thinking about what I've called and what I've defined as an open door. I think in my own mind, it's been easy for me to self-define an open door for the gospel as one that has little to no opposition in it. Yeah, that's an open door. And as soon as there's opposition, what? Closed door. How does that measure up to what you see? It doesn't. That's not what Paul is describing. And, and this is so sweet and so helpful. He, he doesn't say, well, it was, yeah, I, I guess I would say there was an open door for the gospel. It was really, there was a lot of opposition. But yeah, I, I guess if you force me to say, I, I guess I would say there's an open door. He doesn't do that. He says, this was a mega door beyond anything else I've ever experienced yet so far on my missionary journeys. This one's off the charts, this open door. That's how he describes it. And wild beasts coming after him. A wide open door for effective gospel work brought with it such opposition that Paul thought he was going to die. And they went hand in hand. And we need to have room for both. In your own household, all the way to the ends of the earth, and back. But please note the rest of 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse 9, the way that it ends. How does God get glory in that? Here you go. Look at verse 9. We have the sentence of death within ourselves. Why? So that we missionaries would not have confidence in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. You know what Paul thought? Well, if they kill me, God gets the glory for raising me from the dead. He's the one who rescues us, verse 10, from so great a peril of death, and he will rescue us. He on whom we have set our hope, and he will yet rescue us. All he can say is he'll rescue us, he'll rescue us, he'll rescue us. 
God is glorified when a missionary doesn't look at himself and says instead, he'll rescue us. Our hope is in him. He'll rescue us. Even if we die, he rescues us with resurrection. It's going to be amazing. Pastors, evangelists, missionaries must never be self-reliant. They must be brought to the point where they are absolutely convinced that self is completely and entirely unreliable. When the gospel, opposition to the gospel, makes the missionary feel like he's hanging by a thread, life is hanging by a thread, that's when the missionary will look away from himself to God, put his hope in God. That is when a missionary finds hope, and that is when God gets the glory. And Paul's still not done. Look at verse 11. And you, church in Corinth, also joining in helping through your prayers on our behalf. We just don't pray for the advancement of the gospel when the mission is going sweetly in our minds and when there's little to no resistance to us. But boy, would you drop to your knees if you got an email from your missionaries that said, I, th- I, think, we, I think we might die. I think we might die. I-, I know what you would do. I know what I would do. We'd pray. So, turn back a page, 1 Corinthians 16. I will remain in Ephesus until Pentecost because a wide and effective door has opened to me, no stop, and there are many adversaries. Listen, the reason that Paul, the greatest missionary church planter ever, the reason he was so successful was not because he only had open doors before him and no opposition. That's not why he was successful. He didn't live in a world where there was only open doors without opposition. And Paul was the most successful missionary church planner ever, not because opposition was no big deal to him. He was just like one of those strong personality types and persecution was just like water off a duck's back to him. That's not why he was successful. What made that amazing missionary successful was that in a hostile world, God opened a wide door for him to go through. God gave to him effective gospel work through the preaching of the word. And he was successful because he didn't rely on himself as he thought he was going to die in that opposition. And he was successful because churches like Corinth helped him and prayed for him. And our pastors and missionaries will be successful no other way. 1 John 5.19 tells us that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. If that is true, opportunities for the gospel will never be opened naturally. The devil nor the world, they, they will never make a gospel door for us to walk through. Gospel opportunities will only be opened supernaturally by God, and he promised to be with us to the end of the age to open those doors with all of his authority. If that is true, there is only ever going to be a fight as we plead with those who are under the power of the evil one. There will only ever be a fight when we exhort them to deny the evil one, to deny their flesh, to deny the world, and come to Jesus Christ by faith alone. The evil one will never give up enslaved souls without a fight. That is the accurate picture of the gospel landscape from your own household all the way to the ends of the earth. These are inseparable opposites that you must embrace. Let me give you a few takeaways as we finish up. I want you to marvel at the right thing first. Marvel at the right thing. Listen, it is not surprising that there is opposition to the gospel because the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. All of us live behind enemy lines. 
There's no place for you to live where you are not behind enemy lines. Do you understand that? So don't marvel that there's opposition to the gospel. Marvel what? That God opens any doors at all. They're not deserved. We're not worthy of them, but he opens them because it brings glory to him. So marvel at the right thing. Secondly, the fact that opposition to the gospel has risen, it doesn't demand that something has gone wrong in the gospel mission or that the missionary is in the wrong place. We didn't send them to the wrong place because there's so much opposition. It may very well be a sign that everything is going just as planned, right? And related to that, The fact that opposition to the gospel comes doesn't demand that the missionary must flee to safety every time there's opposition. We are all behind enemy lines. Where are you going to flee? Where is spiritual Switzerland? Where are you going to flee for safety? What's interesting is reading through and watching Paul, the the greatest missionary church planner, he knew when to stay, Ephesus. And he knew when to leave, Philippi. And you didn't see him waiting for a note to come back from the church in Antioch of Syria saying, well, here's our um, policy statement on what you should do when you hit opposition, and so you should... Um, if check off, you know, five of seven of these, then you can stay, and anything less than that, you must run for your life. That's not what the church did. Missionaries and their pastors need to develop a wise decision-making process that enables the missionary to make the best decision that they can in the face of the heavy opposition that they're facing. Paul made the decision when to stay, and Paul made the decision when to run for his life. Listen, when you get an email one day from one of our missionaries and they say, I I think we might die, do not email them back and say, run, what are you doing? Don't do that. They are there and we are not. Trust your pastors and your missionaries to know that they've got a plan for them, that they know what to do when the time comes. Just pray for them. Pray for them. Another takeaway The missionary must never rely on self as they walk into gospel opportunities. Many of you I know here are thinking about missions. You're wondering if that's something that God might have for you. Um, And also, if you think that Grace Bible Church is done raising up missionaries because we've kind of done that, we're doing the Papua New Guinea thing, uh, you need to think again. We need more and more and more to be raised up to go. So, Missionaries must never rely on self as they walk into gospel opportunities. So Christian, if you're thinking that this is something maybe that you want to go do, start practicing this today if you're not already. You want self-distrust to be so recognizable to you. You want it to be so familiar to you before you ever become a pastor, before you ever become a missionary. The goal for you is to be able to say, oh, I know how to distrust myself and to trust Jesus. That's what I've been working on every day. It's going to come in handy. And lastly, prayer support for the missionary from the sending church is critical. Remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11, Paul said, you joined in helping us through your prayers on our